What is up, guys? This is Alex Osterley, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Food Marketing Nerds. On the show today, we have Eric Pierce, Director of Business Insights at New Hope Network, and we're talking about 2017 trends that are affecting the natural products and CPG industry. This interview is geared more towards CPG companies, but the macro and cultural shifts that are emerging really apply to anyone whose business model relies on selling what people eat or drink. So restaurant marketers, there's some knowledge to be gained here too. Eric and his team are extremely tapped into the industry and they just released their yearly 2017 report, which is a pretty big deal and you're going to get to hear about it all today. So if you're interested in where the industry is headed and niches that are starting to emerge, you're really going to take away a lot from this episode. So let's go chat with Eric. Welcome to the Food Marketing Nerds Podcast, where we talk marketing, branding, and social media with the smartest minds in the business. Here's your host, Alex Osterley. So, Eric, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Hey, thanks, Alex. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to our conversation. So can you tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself and and what you do? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So my name is Eric Pierce. I work at New Hope, and I am a director of business insights here. I work for our next brand of data and insights consultant services, consulting services. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my main role here is really to leverage the unique power or the unique asset that is new hope within the natural products industry as the hosts of both natural products expos East and West and the NBJ summit every year, as well as Ingredia and also publishers of trade journals uh, serving all aspects of the industry. So my job is to, to turn all this unique insight and data into consulting uh, that will help grow, further fuel the growth of the industry and help those who participate in the industry be more successful. So a lot of our, our listeners already know and are, are familiar with New Hope and, and Next. For those who aren't, can you give a little more background into the industries that are that they cover and, and I guess your areas of expertise? Yeah, absolutely. So So New Hope serves the entire natural products industry, which would include the functional foods business as well as the natural and organic business, uh, personal care um, and home care as well as the supplement business. So all of those aspects, all of those businesses have have coverage through our trade journals as, as well as space and time at the expos every year. My personal area of expertise really is in consumer and market intelligence. Uh, so I've got a 20 plus year history of doing uh, traditional consumer market research. As I moved into my role here at New Hope, uh, I really had fun sort of expanding and modifying my toolkit to ex- you know, use a lot more qualitative and general market intelligence to inform some of the trends work that we do as well as uh, the insights that we bring to companies who are looking to improve the front end of, innova- front end of innovation work that they do. So as far as qualitative data goes, what what is the, the source of that? Is that the, I guess, the macro level view of seeing who's at these shows? And Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of all sorts of different sorts of qualitative. You know, in my old role, qualitative meant going out and talking to consumers, you know, and it meant focus groups or one-on-one interviews and whatnot. When I talk qualitative now, I'm talking strictly not quantitative. And the sources that I'll tap into in a qualitative fashion could be anything from, you know, sort of the immense amount of knowledge that exists within our building. We've, we've because we have these trade journals, we also have uh, an entire staff of writers and editors who are covering the industry um, sort of kind of from supply to shelf, including both the B2B as well as the business to consumer sort of angle within the industry. And the amount of knowledge they have, the number of trends they see, the interviews that they're doing with experts to write their their articles um, every week, you know, is building to this mass of sort of qualitative insight that exists about the industry. Um, It also might mean just going out to directly to people in our network, uh, the retailers who are at our shows, the entrepreneurs or the investors uh, to gather information. Um, but then there's also just an immense amount that we see, like you suggested, at the shows, right? If, if you go to eight shows in a row, you might begin to see patterns, some of which we can actually quantify um, through looking at data that we're capturing at the shows, but some of it is qualitative where you begin to see, hey, there's these interesting patterns um, emerging that may not be easy to quantify just yet, but now it's something that we're beginning to look at because we see see, for example, the, the growth of a kombucha or a cold brew or any of these sorts of trends that you've seen emerge over the last couple of years in the industry. And from a, a trend standpoint of the different, I guess, niches within the industry itself, you mentioned kombucha, cold brew coffee. Is there, 
Are there any others that you're you're starting to see? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it depends on. I, I struggle so much with the how I define starting to see, right? Um, simply because we we see so much. Um, I've got a sort of an ongoing list of almost a hundred or more trend, you know, hundred or more trends that I I'm watching or often find myself talking about or using as examples of of some larger set of trends. Um, our, our organization just finished writing sort of what we think of as the the forecast for 2017. What what the major forces are that we see right shaping the industry. Uh, it's actually a, an annual process that we go through uh, in partnership with. Sterling Rice Group here in, in Boulder, Colorado with us, and it's called The Next Forecast. And within that, we, we describe sort of three major cultural forces and then macro forces within that, and then almost 50 or 60 trends that we see as really instrumental in shaping innovation uh, in the industry in the next year. So to, to call out any one or two can often be very difficult. Um, Though if you push me again, I'm I'm sure I'll I'll find a way to pick a couple for you. <laughs> so from this uh, this 2017 report, has that has that been released? Um, it has just been released. Yeah, so it's actually available at uh, nextforecast.com. Um, so you can learn more about it there and and even you know see a preview and things like that. So it's uh, that one. You know we do a lot of trends work uh, through our trade publications. This is a because it is such a massive effort, such a foundational piece of of work. It's uh, uh, that's a for sale piece. That, that you can learn more about on the website. But um, as anybody knows who you know who pays attention to our newsletters or subscribes to them, uh, there's a lot of free content that we put out as well that that draws upon that piece of work and other things that we're doing throughout the year. Is there anything about that that you can tease with? Uh, I guess an overview of maybe one of the items that that might be influencing somebody in a, the natural products industry either thinking about starting a company or or growing their business oh man um yeah i mean absolutely and, and i'm not there's i'm willing to talk about anything within it it's, it's really the only reason we end up selling it is because there's so much there um that really if you want to have it all you know it's it, we put it into that one place but we talk about the stuff all year and so it it's not it doesn't have to be a tease um it really serves as foundation for for so much of the thinking that we then share um, at our shows and, and in our publications throughout the year, but for for someone starting, um, gosh, for someone starting a business in this space, one of the things that I really like about this forecast effort is um, is it's not just trends in isolation, right? So 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 much of the power I think of understanding trends is not just say, knowing, hey, there's this there's this kombucha thing that's taking off, right? Um, instead, it's it's beginning to understand what the broader context is, what are the other trends that might support the growth of a product trend like kombucha, right? So how does kombucha fit into the bigger understanding of uh, home experimentation that we're seeing with fermentation or other products that are experimenting with fermentation? And how does that tie into the science that is connected to, to gut health and general health overall? And how does that kind of then expand into different aspects of um, macro forces shaping the, space, the industry? And, and this book is designed to kind of make those connections. What we really describe that I think are important things for anyone in the industry to understand is what are these macro forces? What are these cultural forces that are creating the sustainable momentum behind the trends, right? So the fact that Chia doesn't just come and go as a fad, in our opinion, um, is really because there's a lot of other things supporting that, right? The fads like uh, uh, exp weird experimental foods like the cronuts, you know, and other things like that, they're fun and they're playful and it's kind of like uh, the fashion industry. It's great to throw out some crazy stuff, you know, just to kind of keep people interested in moving through the door and doing different things. Um, but, you know, things like that come and go. The things that really stay are the ones that have supporting trends kind of helping to carry some of the momentum and ensure that these trends don't just die off. Um, effectively, what I'm saying is they have more substance or meaning because they're tapping into these, these bigger things. And so we often talk about the, the cultural awakening, or actually in, our, in the forecast, we talk about the cultural awakening. We talk about the, the changes in the demands on modern life and even technology and how these things are influencing um, the evolution evolution of the natural products industry and innovation within it. Hmm, that's interesting. What is what is one of the ways that technology is, is having a major impact? 
Yeah, so one of the ways in which technology, I think, is, is influencing innovation within the natural products industry um, really is, is exhibited through a, a macro force that we describe as, as flat earth, right? So this idea of the flattening of our earth, if you will, the, the interconnections, the ease of interconnections and, and exploration um, really are changing in many ways uh, flavor profiles, but also the ways in which consumers engage. So trends that we talk about within this idea of kind of this increasing complexity, but also this increasing ease of connecting to things within our environment um, can result in trends like adventurous palettes, right? We're, we're seeing, and I wouldn't be the only one to talk about millennials and others, um, having an increased appetite for um, ethnic foods and new flavors, right? So we're seeing that expand as a, as a place of, of engagement for consumers where they're, and, and manufacturers where they're actually experimenting with different flavor profiles that are inspired by um, ethnic cuisines and, and sometimes even use uh, or bringing in or importing products that maybe aren't familiar to Americans, but are traditional sort of ethnic cuisines, but also sometimes using ethnic flavors as a source of inspiration. So at Expo East earlier this year, we saw um, basically a, a hummus pod. The brand, the brand is called hummus pod, but it's effectively um, like the, uh, the toaster pizza products of, of you know, 10 years ago. Uh, but now it's a, it's a little bit of falafel with a hummus stuffed in it. And it's, you know, sort of shaped into this small pod type sort of sort of format, which, again, is not necessarily an ethnic cuisine on its own, but it's inspired by it, um, and it is kind of meeting this unique need of snacking and desire for more ethnic flavors within that freezer section of, of the grocery store. So I, I can definitely definitely see how that, that ease of seeing that information, or I just think of Instagram, for example, I see a, a picture of, of a friend traveling in Thailand or something, and I'm like, oh, God, I want Pad Thai right now, or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of silly, but it's... Uh, I think there is some correlation between that. Yeah, you know, one of my uh, one of my favorite anecdotal stories to tell um, is one that often comes up when when you know people are trying to talk about millennials, right? And and sometimes you get a lot of this sort of millennial backlash of oh, you know, millennials aren't all that different, or or this or that, or people kind of uh, want to to believe a certain stereotype about millennials, and 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 or just put off you know any of the thought that. You know, maybe we've overhyped this idea of, of millennials really being this this distinctly different generation. And and one of the things, especially when it comes to thinking about millennials and their orientation to food, that I like to to point out to people or remind people is that, you know, the the millennial generation is the first generation to grow up with things like Instagram. Right? This is the first generation of U.S. consumers to grow up with almost instant access to any information that they want, right? And how that relates to food. I, I like to paint the picture for people of my generation, right? <laughs> I'm not that old, but um, my experience growing up is distinctly different than, uh, than a lot of people more recently, right? When I grew up, if you wanted entertainment on a Friday evening, um, you, you had your TV, right? You, you didn't really have the internet yet. You know, you had dial-up. You weren't, you weren't watching YouTube. YouTube didn't exist. Um, you were going to the movie theater, you know, finding something social to do out and about, or you're going to Blockbuster for a video, right? Um, in the, in the, if you think about the role that food documentaries do you think about the role that Instagram can play? You think about the role that immediate information and idea sharing can play. Um, you begin to see how dramatically different my generation, my Gen X generation is from the millennial generation, right? Well, if I wanted entertainment on a Friday evening when I was growing up, it meant a 30-minute drive to the Blockbuster. It meant searching Blockbuster for 30 minutes and trying to figure out, oh my gosh, I've got this, I have to make a decision on one video cassette to bring home for inter my entertainment tonight, right? So you, you toil and you worry and you think about it in 30 minutes, you pick something out, you, you've got this big sort of opportunity cost of it. This isn't the good one. You know, I've spent all this time picking it out. I've got to drive back home and then I watch it. And then I've got to return the problem. You know, I've got to return the thing, right? So the amount of investment that went into picking one video for entertainment was relatively large today. And, and by the way, when the investment was that large and the opportunity cost was that big, no one was picking up Food Inc., Right? No one was picking up food documentaries to take home on a Friday night. I mean, maybe somebody did, right? But that wasn't what you were doing unless you were already crazy interested in the topic. Today, you can pick in minutes what you want to watch, and there's no opportunity cost. If you don't like it, you click to something else in a moment later. The opportunity cost of experimenting with information and ideas is almost zero. 
And the millennial generation is the first generation to grow up with that kind of opportunity for exposure to ideas related to food that no other generation has ever had before. And I think that in a huge way, while I'm not saying millennials are the only ones causing this food movement and evolution in this space, when we talk about millennials really being oriented to food and to more progressive food ideas differently, I can believe that the role of information, this flattening of the earth, the connection, the, easy, the ease of connection and sharing ideas really can have a major impact in how this generation has grown up and become oriented to these sorts of topics. And that is a really interesting insight about the opportunity cost of exploring new content because I hadn't even thought of that. I would have never watched Food Inc. or any of these other documentaries about food if I was going to Blockbuster to get an the next new release dvd because it's again there's there's so much that goes into choosing or or renting plus the the cost has come down so substantially to to consume this content so it's that's that's really interesting and and again it's oh you watched food inc would you like to watch fat sick and nearly dead and then you just keep going down that that wormhole of of all these different pieces of content so that's really interesting is there so I'm I'm really interested in, in this report and I'm sure our, our listeners are too. As far as the so t- taking kombucha for example, and we're we're looking at maybe a, a more acidic base or, or flavor profile that uh, people's preferences are, are shifting toward. I, are there? I'm, I'm trying to Id- identify the the cultural shifts that would lead to something like that. I mean, is that is that something that's covered in the report? Um, yeah, I don't, you know, generally speaking, I'm not sure we tackled, you know, kombucha specifically this time around, but the, the framework for thinking about that exists. And, and the framework for thinking about that one really ties into the cultural trends. So again, we start with cultural trends, and then we zoom into macro trends, and then we zoom into actual product trends, right? Um, the, the cultural trend that shapes and creates the opportunity for that is, is something that we call cultural awakening, right? So this is uh, the gradual growth of awareness, if you will, um, and connection to, to ideas within the marketplace. So increasingly, we're seeing that a lot of what is, is shaping the evolution of this space is this this spread of culture awakening through in a population, right? It, it's the it's new awareness to previously unknown issues or ideas, and it's influencing um, sort of both business and and you know I'm very excited that it's actually driving more conscious business thinking and conscious business practices, but it's also driving and influencing more conscious engagement in food choices um, and awareness of topics that we hadn't previously thought about. So within that awareness, one thing, um, and when the, within this idea of cultural awakening, one of the things that often triggers consumers are these sort of negative products, the, uh, uh, the watch out ingredients, right? Or, or the lightning rods out there. You think GMOs, um, think organic versus non-organic, think, you know, uh, confined feedlots, all these sorts of triggers, as well as individual ingredients, things people can't, don't feel like they can pronounce, or pesticides, or, uh, or s- sort of stabilizers and fillers that people, people believe are in their foods, um, is this also this idea of sugar. So right now, what's going on is we're seeing, you know, a huge trigger in the marketplace, a huge point of new awakening and awareness for consumers is concerns about sugar and how much sugar we're consuming and the potential, um, sorry, not really potential, the very likely, and, and we're beginning to see more and more science associated with the negative health impacts of sugar. So for many consumers, that might be the entry point. That might be the initial point of awakening where somebody begins to pay attention to and think more about food. Uh, for others, that's just another step in the journey or another issue for them to think about. If we go down this path of sugar, we find our way, and I'm not saying this is the only path to kombucha, but I'm saying within the context, this is one of those things that you can begin to see is that as people begin to say, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be drinking two sodas a day, right? They begin to look for their alternatives. What are the alternatives? What are the lower sugar alternatives? Um, And kombucha with its, you know, like you suggested, more sour um, sort of uh, astringic or vinegar sort of flavor profile, and I think has captured a lot of consumers' attention, not only because it ties into uh, fermentation and sort of gut health uh, and probiotic topics, but also because it, it offers up, at least for many of these products, many of them are, are far too sweet, um, in my opinion, but 
you know, at, a, at, a, at its base level, um, many consumers are potentially seeking out a kombucha because it is a different flavor profile. It is satisfying. Um, and for many, thirst quenching um, in a way that, that it offers an option to replace what would have been a sugary beverage within their, within their um, daily habit or routines, if you will. All right. That makes sense. And I, I, I love kombucha and it, a lot of the kombucha that, that I drink is, is, it is sweet, a little bit sweet, but the, the sugar content is extremely low. So it's, it's kind of that, it scratches that itch of, of wanting that, that bit of sweetness, but it doesn't have that, that any of that same, no, nowhere near the same amount of sugar as, as, uh, just a a straight fruit juice or, or a, a soda. So yeah, and it allows you to get back to thinking about beverages as a functional as a functional item. What's interesting, we were uh, a couple of us were talking about this over lunch the other day. Um, the Coca Colas, the Dr Peppers, even the Seven Ups of the world started as functional beverages, right? They started as things you would buy at a pharmacy, right? They started as herbal concoctions that had a functional benefit for consumption. And they've lost that, right? They've lost that as they become, you know, strictly sugar-sweetened beverages with artificial flavors and things. But what we're kind of doing is we're kind of going back to this idea of let's think about, in many ways, um, our beverages as functional beverages. Let's get some benefit out of it if we're going to consume it. Um, and there's, I wouldn't say everyone's thinking that way, but we're seeing definitely a lot of innovation uh, in this functional beverage space. Uh, something we just, you know, came out of Expo East is, is really almost that turnaround that I was describing. We're seeing a lot of now what I would call herbal tonics or er- herbal elixirs, but these are ready to drink beverages, right? So the natural products industry has always had their tonics and their elixirs, you know, or things that you might dilute and mix with water or things you might take for, you know, sp- you wouldn't drink it for you know, you wouldn't necessarily drink it for enjoyment. You'd drink it for its functional or medicinal um, benefits. And instead, what we're seeing now is people really experimenting. Take, you know, they're taking the vitamin water idea of 15 or more years ago, whatever it was, and kind of blowing that up and saying, it's not just vitamin water and Gatorade anymore, but there's a, a lot of different things we can do. And, and maybe energy, right? Every, any, every energy drink that was out there. Let's start exploring the other kinds of functional benefits that we can we can approach with beverages and let's do it from this this natural perspective with uh with herbs and other supplemental ingredients hmm. so are, are you familiar with the the book blue ocean strategy i am not i'll have to add that one to my uh to read list it's uh, i've actually never read it but one of our previous guests is the the cmo of white castle kim bartley um really interesting lady she's she's got a lot of, of amazing amazing insights she was telling me that was she's also a, a professor at Ohio State, and uh, she was telling me that's the first book that she recommends that all of her students read, and basically it's it's the idea that that companies can succeed by creating blue oceans of this this untapped market space or uncontested market space versus battling with the competitors and battling in the red ocean and that's where all the because that's where all the blood is all the competition is is killing each other I guess so I. I don't know if there's any data, whether it's uh, anecdotal or qualitative or um, or quantitative, of looking and seeing if there's any novelty to to trying to invent your own category in itself. If you are are seeing some sort of of, of trend within a within your your community versus jumping on to a, a product category that maybe has a a, a market leader already. Is there anything to, that you could speak to that? Yeah, yeah, there's all sorts of that. I call it almost new to the world style of innovation, right? Where it's like you are creating the category for yourself. Um, some of that is happening in these crazy competitive spaces, right? Like some of the new beverage innovations, it's fun to have a conversation with somebody who worries about distribution or retail because they're like, where are we going to stock that, right? When someone starts asking that question of where does this get stocked, you're having a question about that blue ocean, sort of that white space of, you know, it, it, sometimes that's a bad thing because especially from a retail and a merchandising standpoint, if you don't know where to put it, then consumers don't know where to look for it. And potentially you end up in three different places and three different stores and it becomes hard to be nowhere to be found for consumers and also just for retailers to kind of know where they should be stocking the product. 
Um, but products that kind of fit into that sort of like, gosh, where do I put this space that, that are, are really new in innovation? Um, I'd say a lot of the, the alternative meat and dairy product innovation right now has the potential to be in that space. They're creating a new category. And, and not that veggie burgers haven't been around forever or soy milk hasn't been around forever, but we're seeing people kind of try to do interesting new things in that space. I think Impossible Foods and um, you, had, you had Beyond Meat on uh, – uh, on one of your podcasts recently, are really kind of trying to create that new space, right? Think about the the Beyond Burger getting placed within the meat section, right? So that's that is in some ways opening up a new category in an old category, right? Now they're saying, as as they say them have said themselves, we want to, you know, it's great that the vegans are vegetarians, you know, or the flexitarians want our product and love our product, but really at the end of the day. We're going after those who are, are willing to consume less meat or would consider us a, a viable alternative in certain situations. Um, and the fact that they're being placed in, that, in, the, in the meat department, I think, is, is part of that, trying to create that blue ocean. Now, they're going into red ocean in some ways, but they're coming in with a different message. So I do think they are standing out um, and can easily differentiate themselves versus other products in that space. Um, Perfect Day. Uh, are you familiar with with Perfect Day? Um, no. Who are they? They are a. They're going to be launching this year, 2017. They are effectively a culture. Oh gosh, <laughs> all sorts of different ways this could be interpreted. A cultured dairy product, uh, milk alternative. So when I'm saying cultured here, I'm not saying fermented. I'm saying um, that they are creating a real milk product um, that didn't require a cow. Right, so they are using. I forget if they're using what what plant species or what they're using, or or if it's uh, yeasts. Actually, it's yeast. So they are brewing. So when I say culture, maybe brewing is the better way of saying it. They are brewing proteins, casein and whey. Right, all the proteins that you need to create milk. They are brewing them using yeasts in a in a process that looks a lot like brewing beer. Um, and and once they've created those proteins, they can effectively make milk right uh, and they can do it it's crazy fr- <laughs> right exactly it's, it's like the uh, and they probably want to create a meaningful distinction it's, but it's like the idea of a lab grown meat product right it's, it's like the idea of growing a uh, a meat culture um, in a laboratory, right? Uh, it's, it's slightly different again, but, but the basic idea is there conceptually for the, for the mainstream consumer. And so, you know, that is the kind of product that, again, when it launches this year, that is, that is wide open space, you know, moving into a competitive space of, of milk alternatives and milk, right, in a, in a commodity industry at the same time coming in with something that is, you know, entirely different and has an incredible sustainability story um, and, at least they, they say this, I, I haven't tried it, but, you know, would they say performs just like milk in baking and other applications, has the same mouthfeel, tastes like milk. It is milk, right? <laughs> um, so anyways, lots of interesting innovation, some of it really far out there like that, that I would definitely put into your, into your blue ocean space, but also creative ways where, where individuals can create new markets in, in crowded spaces like we talked about with Beyond Meat. Think about uh, the whole cricket flower and cricket, space think about chapool with their cricket bars right they're entering into a uh, a red ocean of of highly competitive bar space but they're doing so with a, a different enough strategy and they're building a market of of cricket based products and insect based products um that in many ways is also a, a blue ocean strategy hmm, that's really interesting have you tried the, the the milk substitute product or the the I, I don't even know what you would call that. Um, I have not. Yeah, I, I play with that idea some, too, of like, wait, can you call this milk substitute? What do you call this? Is it vegan? Is it not vegan? Clearly, it's it's attractive to the vegan consumer group, um, at least some of them who opt in for, for animal welfare reasons. Um, that is their reason for creating this product is to, um, ha- you know, to create the environmental and the animal welfare benefits that, you, that one can create from taking the cow out of the... Uh, the milk creation process, um, but yeah, what do you call it? Where do you put it? It's I have not had a chance to try it. Um, it's very interesting. I'm excited to see how it how it performs and and how it does. And um, if all goes as planned, they should be launching in 2017. Hmm, that's really interesting. And I, I could sit and ask you questions all day. These are I, your work is really interesting, and I, you guys have some incredible insights. Um, w- 
we're gonna have to have you on for a, a, a later episode to to continue the conversation. But I've got I've got a few a few questions that I ask each of our our, our podcast guests, and uh, I, I'm gonna kind of tailor these because because I think you bring a different perspective to the table. Is there is there anything else in 2017? One of the maybe a, a big glaring trend or, or mo- emerging cultural shift or whatever it is or macro a trend that all people in the industry should should be aware of yeah god i'm glad you asked that question that's really um there you know i don't know if i would classify it as a trend in the same way that i talk about some of the other trends right where there's uh, a certain amount of demonstrated potential and a certain amount of you know exhibited innovation going on in this space um but one of the things that i'm most excited about right now for for the food and beverage industry overall, maybe for all consumer goods, is the opportunity right now to make a connection uh, between, I'm just going to say food right now, but we can, again, the idea is, is much larger than that. Um, but to make the connection between the food we consume every day and, and climate change, right? We have for decades been building consumer interest and concern and motivation about climate change. But historically, I would say in general, um, environmentalists and, and industry have really in many ways failed to give consumers tangible, meaningful things that they can do to have a positive impact on climate change, right? You know, we, we told people when the ozone layer was at risk to, to replace the refrigerators, right? We needed to get rid of those CFC emitting refrigerators, right? Um, when, when Al Gore sort of really started capturing consumer interest in, in global warming and, and climate change, we told people it was all about the fossil fuels and that we needed to buy expensive light bulbs, we needed to turn off our lights, we needed to walk to work, or we needed to buy $40,000 electric or hybrid cars, right? Re- reconfiguring your lifestyle to walk to work or to, to buy these refrigerators and, you know, even $30 light bulbs was difficult for people to swallow, let alone a $40,000 car, right? We've, we've given people things that they can do, but they've always been small things like turning off the water while you're brushing your teeth or really expensive and hard to do things like buying new cars. But we have an opportunity right now because the food world's being disrupted. Consumers are going through this awakening. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more consumers engaging in food in more thoughtful ways than they have in a very long time. At the same time, we also see consumer interest and concern about global warming really kind of getting to this critical tipping point. So we've got tipping point in consumer changes about their food and consumer motivation with global climate change. And we have the opportunity to show consumers how food can actually begin to help us improve or even reverse global climate change. There's this topic of of regenerative agriculture, right? That if we can get people growing our food the right way, we can actually use photosynthesis, the natural process of growing our foods to sequester carbons back in our soils where they belong. And, And the scientists who are researching this are suggesting that in relatively short order, we could begin taking out as much, if not more, carbon out of the atmosphere than we're putting into it every year, right? We have a huge potential here, and we have consumers who are interested. So what we need to do, in my opinion, what we need to do as an industry is we need to think more about agriculture and where our food is coming from and how it's being produced. The industry has always been great at thinking about those things, but now what we also need to do is begin to show consumers how three, five, eight dollar purchases every day at the grocery store, every time we eat something, we have an opportunity to contribute to further climate change or to begin to put us on a path towards reversing it, to create the demand in the marketplace that shows our growers, that shows our producers the types of foods that we want and the fact that we want organic and regenerative agriculture and agricultural practices that can actually help fix this problem. That, to me, is the biggest idea in food today um, and the opportunity that we have to make those connections between concerns for the environment and the purchases we make every day for what we eat and how we sustain ourselves um, is, is now and huge. The idea for this time has come, and I'm really excited about its, its potential. Yeah, I think that's a really, really insightful approach to to, to climate change. It's that the practical application of one a, a two dollar purchase, a five dollar purchase, as opposed to feeling like I have to go buy buy a Tesla or else the, I'm going to ruin the world. Yeah, it's. I, I think that's a, a really, really interesting and and exciting emerging awareness, I guess, to what people can actually do themselves. So, I'm glad you glad you mentioned that. 
Yeah, lots lots of work to be done in that space, but um, exciting and so worthwhile. It's uh, I, ho- I hope we can get more and more people thinking that way and and motivated, and then also knowing what they can do um, to to impact that. So moving on to our next question is: Do you is there any? I know you mentioned Food Inc. I I don't know if this would be even fall in this category, but are there any any books or or documentaries that you always recommend to people? Yeah, there's all sorts of them. Um, I, I was looking through my Audible, so I'm I'm an Audible guy. Uh, I rarely have time to actually sit in place long enough to to read a book, but um, I'm moving enough where I can still listen that I, I get through all my books through Audible. So I was looking through my my Audible library, and I, I wrote down way too many. Um, the one that I think I end up recommending most often to people is actually the Dorito effect. Uh, really interesting thinking on uh, this idea of nutritional wisdom and how the food we eat is actually destroying it. I'll leave it at that. Great book, uh, worth a read. Um, in the agriculture space that we're kind of talking about in farming um, that, that I was just referencing, lots of good books there. Dan Barber's Third Plate is just a, an incredible read, really interesting, thought-provoking ideas. Um, books like Gaining Ground and The Soil Will Save Us uh, and The End of Plenty are all really interesting reads from a, an agriculture standpoint and, and thinking about the connection between uh, different types of agriculture and, and climate change. Um, so, so love all those books. Um, love, love those books. We talked a little bit about you know probiotics and things today. So there's some really interesting uh, books out there on that. The Good Gut uh, was a great one. Um, and then connecting, going beyond sort of the microbiome in us to the role of microbes in um, in our soils and in the evolution and the and the health of our planet. Uh, there's there's the book called uh, Life's Engines and the Hidden Half of Nature. Also really interesting read. So lots of good stuff out there. That's kind of my short list of the my favorite books from the last 12 months, maybe. That's great. And we'll link those up in the show notes because uh, I'm definitely going to check those out. I feel I feel a little ignorant. I haven't even heard of the, any of those books. So like, oh, these are, these are good. These are good. I'm writing these down. I tend to go down some rabbit holes. So some of those are not necessarily blockbusters, but uh, uh, yeah. Those are the best finds. So where can people go to find out more about this report, what you guys are doing at Next and New Hope? Yeah, absolutely. So I would, I would recommend if, if the people are just interested in, in more of the kinds of stuff we've been talking about, just to, to go to newhope.com um, and subscribe to some of our newsletters. Lots of great content coming out all, all the time. Um, not necessarily just mine. Actually, I, I do relatively little writing, um, but we've got this incredible team that's always putting out great content and thought leadership. So uh, first off, just, just go to newhope.com, sign for the newsletters uh, or make it, you know, make it a, a website you visit, you know, daily, weekly, whatever. Um, for the forecast document we were talking about, you can learn more about that at uh, nextforecast.com and about the, the broader sort of next services, you could go to what's next to natural.com. And uh, that is the longest URL ever before you put it in the dot com. But um, it is it is what we do. What's next to natural. So, well, Eric, this has been great. We're going to have to have you on the show as a guest in the future because there's just so many other questions I had popping up and your your insights just continue to, to, to grow. And you they you have this great information. And I'm sure everyone in our in our listener base enjoyed getting to, getting to hear what you had to say. Great. Well, Alex, thanks for making this possible and uh, giving us all a forum to, to share these kinds of ideas and conversations with others. Um, and thanks to those who, who listen as well. So. Thank you all again so much for listening to the podcast. And if you guys are finding any value or enjoying what you're listening to, we would really appreciate if you could go over to iTunes and give us your honest feedback in the ratings and review section. It would really help us out. So thank you all again, and we'll look forward to talking to you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Food Marketing Nerds Podcast. For interview transcripts or to download your free social media ebook, check out foodmarketingnerds.com.